Hi, everyone. Matthew Hendershot here from the I'll Take a Shot at That podcast. I'm just going to step in here before this episode begins to let you know that this conversation does go to a fairly serious place and we deal with some mental health topics and we get into talking about suicide. So if you are sensitive to that sort of thing or you think that maybe, you know, could trigger some some feelings or some concerns in this time, uh, I encourage you to listen to this conversation, um, but do so at your discretion. If you think it should be an issue, then we hope to catch you on a, a future episode. But otherwise, please enjoy, and I hope you get something great out of this conversation. Hey, what's up, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of I'll Take a Shot at That, the podcast for thinkers, wanderers, and drink and ponderers. Of course, I am your host, Matthew Hendershot, and I'm very excited uh, today. Um, we are here in quarantine still in the I'll Take a Shot at That studios, but because of the magic of the internet, I am very honored and happy to welcome to this episode of the podcast, Marcel Isidoro, all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Marcel, welcome to I'll Take a Shot at That. How are you doing? Thank you very much for having me, Matt. I'm really well. I'm also in quarantine here for, I think, almost two and a half weeks now, three weeks maybe. Okay. So it's been a crazy experiment, I think, for all of us. <laughs> and how about you? How are you? Uh, I, hanging in there, doing a, okay. We're in the second official week of quarantine mm -hmm. uh, as as we record this here. Uh, and I'm just, like I said, sitting in the studio. Uh, we just had a brief chat before things got started uh, in, in that, oddly, I'm actually more busy in these days uh, than I was before. And I think a lot of that is because of the nature of podcasting. Mm -hmm. Yes. And... Uh, you know, we're always hunting around looking for interesting people, uh, people who are podcasters. I know you are a podcaster yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, for the uh, the audience that, that may not know that yet, and we want to get into that. But um, I actually find that the people that I'm interested to talk to, because everything is sort of ground to a halt, have more availability now to have those kind of conversations with me. So my calendar has been filled up with Interviews like this via online, VOIP, and video hangout. Mm -hmm. Yes, same thing here. I think me and my associates here in my podcast company, we are now more busy because we need to take care of things at home. We need to to take care of our spouses and, and children and family and also have, have the podcast, also deal with clients. So my nights have been too long. My days are also mm -hmm. being too long. And at the same time, I also have a lot of free time because I have to wait for people to be done with things or be available, you know, or to get used to in this flow of the new normal yeah. that we are living. Yeah, it's certainly, certainly quite strange. Um, I want to talk about all of this stuff that is occupying all of your time. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we get started, I, I do want to ask, are you joining me today in a shot? I, I like to kick off all the episodes of I'll Take a Shot at That with an actual shot. And I know you can't be here, otherwise I would pour one for you. Yeah, here uh, But I'll it's, definitely pour one here for my... Here it's, it's the morning, so I have my cup of coffee. That's fine. We'll, we'll allow it. The, the uh, coffee is totally acceptable yeah. morning shot anywhere you are. I myself am enjoying some hazelnut flavored Hotanus O'Donnell Moonshine. Oh, wow. So uh, O'Donnell Moonshine is out of Berlin, Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very, very kind. They do sponsor the podcast and uh, have set me up with this. So I'll be sipping this throughout the show while you sip on your coffee. Yeah. And hopefully it lubricates us into having a really great uh, and interesting conversation. So cheers to you, sir. Saluji. Cheers. I'm sorry. What was that? Is it Sa Saluji? Saluji. Saluji. Yes. Saluji. Yes. That's cheers I in love Portuguese. It. Yes. I love it. I love it. One of my longtime favorite games is to collect the cheers uh, from all over the world in any place that I visit and go. So, Sauji, I will keep <laughs> and add add to the the list. Um, so we we let the cat out of the bag a little bit on the podcasting front. So why don't we start there? Uh, I know that you know my listenership probably is 
uh, unaware that they may be familiar with some of your work, why don't you uh, explain to the listeners what it is that you do from a podcasting? Yes. Yeah, so my my artist name, if you will, it's M M Isidoro, but a lot of people call me Marcel, mm-hmm. Mama. So you can find me in the internet if you if you Google that. But I have a company here in Brazil called Ampere. Ampere. And what and what we do in the podcast business here, I would say, is that we are a creative audio company. So we do creative mm-hmm. projects based on audio. I have a 22 year career into in the filmmaking industry. So I so I was a director, producer, and and writer in films and TV shows and commercials before this. But I think audio has a quality that was missing for me for, from from the video part of things. You know, uh, audio has mm-hmm. a, a quality, a, a primal quality of we are around the fire together. We are in, in talking to people in their prime time. So like they choose to have us with them when they are busy doing something. You know, we are like joining them, making them feel more comfortable while they are driving, doing exercises, working, doing dishes, whatever. In video, you have mm-hmm. you have to stop and pay attention. In audio, you can just listen. So that for me was a huge thing. And I have a friend, which is my business partner now. He he's been doing podcasts since two thousand and three, I think, or two thousand and five. Mm. So mm-hmm. so two of my business partners they've been doing podcasts since before the name podcast existed. It was like audio through IP or <laughs> something like that, internet audio. I don't know what the name was back then. But he he used to work on Facebook here in Brazil. I do a lot of work for Facebook here in Brazil too. He was an old friend as well. So when he left Facebook, we decided to work together and we founded this company. So now what we what, what we are doing is we, we do have a slate of original shows. We try to focus more not in the interviewing because I think there's a lot of people like you who are really good at this. But we do like audio dramas. We do uh, audio books as well. We are now, mm-hmm. right now, I'm working in a great project that has a lot to do with what we're going to talk later, another spoiler, about how we can help people, especially the poor people, to get out, out, out of the status quo by taking care of their bodies, their minds, their communities. So I'm, I'm writing and directing that with the biggest rapper in Brazil in the moment oh. called Emicida. So so we are working in this project for for the past month together and it's going to come out in 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 a month's time. So okay. so it's been quite interesting to work in this audio in this audio thing and and I host most of the podcasts for HBO at uh, HBO Brazil. So we do all of the podcasts for HBO here of of their international shows so at their foreign TV shows, we do a companion podcast for them. So I've okay. I've hosted the podcast, the original podcast, official podcast for Watchmen, His Dark Materials. Uh, now we are doing Westworld, Katie King. Wow. So a lot of the big shows. It's good because we can watch like a month before anyone else. So we don't have to wait week week by week to watch. Oh, Okay. And the horrible thing is you, that... You get advanced... Sorry? No, I was just going to say, you get advanced screeners on all this stuff so that you can talk about it like the podcast is ready to go. Yeah, the podcast right drop the in the airs. minute that the that the episode finishes airing at HBO here. So... Yeah. So, this is a... It, it, this is very much like a spin-off of the concept of like the talking dead, right? Like that's kind of the first yes. thing that I can think of that yes. did that. Is that... Yeah, is that accurate? Is that the first, like, hey, a show happened, and then immediately after we're going to have this show that we talk about the show you just watched? Yeah, it's kind of that. We try to have a spin on it, so we try to have, like, on, on Watchmen. On Watchmen, we were talking about the show, but we're also explaining a lot of the show because the show has deep roots in American culture, in American history. So how mm. we can do, draw uh, 
a parallels for like the normal folk can understand who was Nixon, who was what was the the black riots in the 70s, what is the alternate right. timeline that the show happens, what is happening in Brazil right now that it's similar to what is happening in the show, you know? Because there's a lot of things that if you miss, you won't make a big difference if you just watch the, watch the show. But if you have this information, it's good. So all of the shows, yeah, we like- try to have this extra, you know, like thing. So it's more of a companion than an explaining or a or a recap show, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. More adding context uh, to help it yes. be better understood. Yes. Interesting, interesting. So this is what I'm um, doing on the podcast, and we also work, we like to work with a lot of brands. So we are doing a lot of branded podcasts, so, which is great for the pocket, not too great in the in the creative part, but I love my, my clients in here because as podcast is so new, especially here in Brazil, people are giving us a lot of leeway to like create content, to create things, to talk, especially in my work, I like to work with with propositive ideas, with ideas that even though I'm talking, so like I'm talking, we do a podcast here for a company that it's like an Uber. So it's called 99 and it's a, yeah. and it's a Uber-like riding share company. And we do this podcast for the drivers, but we managed okay. to, to bring a LGBT woman to to host the show because they there's a lot of problems with like drivers and women women drivers are like one or two percent of their of of the total drivers they have so how i can help them to stop having the prejudice and the ideas they used to have you know so uh, even though wow we are doing a branded podcast talking about how to invest your money why you have to work in the during holidays and all the stuff like this that this company needs, we always push something else, you know, like how yeah we can help create a new narrative, if you will. God, that's a fantastic idea. Yeah, so it's I, a- I absolutely I absolutely love that. This concept of like, yeah, you're you're kind of a kept audience. This is conveying to you, it's like, and you don't even have to like draw that much of a spotlight to something like that. You just let it be known Mm -hmm. and then normalize, right? Because all these drivers are sitting there and they're getting normalized to the fact that they're being spoken to by a human who just happens to be LGBTQ. uh, And and it's just like, yep, nope, it's just a person. Yep. Like ignoring all the labeling and wow, that, that is... That is super clever. Yeah, so that's wow. what I like to do in my whole work. Uh, in my Love filmmaking it. days, I have my latest two feature films. One, it's a horror movie. The other is a sci-fi musical. Crazy enough. and <laughs> A sci-fi musical? Yeah. You know Once, the Irish film? Yes, of course. Yeah, so it's like Once, but if, if Once happened during the end of the world. So like now? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so, no. like, it's two people that are musicians and they play beautiful folk songs together. But the and a lot of the worlds are ending. Yeah. A... So, wow. I learned that throughout my 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 work and my life because I've been traveling so much through the whole world. And one thing that really blew my mind is when I realized that, as you said, we are humans. You know, like, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter the color of my skin, which language I speak, uh, my religious beliefs. We are humans. So how I can normalize that in a narrative way? So in my horror film was the first, like, I have black. It's based on Brazilian history and Brazilian mythologies. So, like, the the villain and the, and the story happens in a farm with slaves, and it's based on... On Brazilian folklore, but it's like a slasher mm-hmm. movie. Teenagers going to a farm to have sex and fun during a weekend, and they find a monster. Classic. But, yeah, of course they do. Yeah. So, like, the heroes there are like black people, you know? Okay. And it was crazy because, like, this movie I did with like $50,000 with my friends, and I sold it for like two in 
to 20 countries. It showed in the in movie theaters here in Brazil. The biggest network here in Brazil bought it because nobody saw a really well done Brazilian slasher, and all of the foreigners never saw uh, black people in that hero perspective. You know, like of how they could do. And it was the biggest, the best critical response of my life. And the best critic wow. that I ever received was a child. Like here in Sao Paulo City, we have a public screening circuit. So like the, the mayor's office has free cinemas in a lot of cultural places in, in the city, right. especially in the poor places. So it's free or it's like... Sure. 50 cents of a dollar something like that uh so so like you can just go and watch a movie that it's on the movie theater and in the third week that we were showing a girl a 13 year old girl wrote me an email she found my email on the internet in the library and just to thank me because it was the first time that she saw someone that looked like her in a movie that wasn't a maid a slave a uh, hooker, a uh, drug lord, and now she mm. she for and she cry watching that because now she had the potential to be something else, and it was just wow. a slasher movie, you know. So mm. yeah, so like with that on uh, on the next movie, uh, it's a love story, and the guy on the love story on the, of the couple, he's fat. So like, why? And the girl, she's pretty, not like the normal bombshell blonde pretty. She's a gorgeous woman. So like for the first third of the movie, everybody's like, why this girl hooking up with this guy? Just because he's like, you can see on people's faces. And then there's a mm. song that he does that like he gives all of his heart to the song and you see everybody fall in love with him. Oh, You know, so like... How I can do that? How I can have the narrative change? So in this, I have a sex scene on the movie. Spoiler alert. So like there's a sex scene on the movie that it's the opposite. It's the girl making the guy taking his clothes off, like making his mind because he's fat and he doesn't like his body. So like it's her being mm. all seductive so he can have sex with her. You know, like, you never see this in a movie. Usually it's like a hot guy and a girl with glasses and bad hair. And by the end of the movie, right. you know, like, she has the glasses off. She's using all designer clothes. So how I can bring that with in, in my work? Like, it's just there. And in the middle of the work, yeah. you can just wake up to, oh, it's just a person. Of course he's falling in love. Of course an LGBTQ woman... Is gonna talk to me about investment if I'm a a ride share driver, you know? Yeah, just normalizing it. Normalizing. Yes, it. that's fantastic. Uh, we've talked a bit about um, your background as you you come from a filmmaking background. You're obviously a, a creative person, uh, much like myself, in a lot of different disciplines: doing podcasting, doing audio engineering, photography and videography, writing and directing. Um, how are these things impacted, do you find, uh, with what we're going through right now? I know we kind of mentioned a little bit, like, on the podcasting front, I actually find myself more busy, mm -hmm. but on the filmmaking, on the filmmaking and the photography side, right now, that's just dead. Uh, there are no calls coming for any of that stuff, but I do get people all the time who want to do an interview or to be on, on the cast. Are you seeing something similar? Are you seeing different things from your perspective? Uh, what's going on as far as your career standpoint from where you sit right now in uh, in Sao Paulo? Yeah, like for me, like I have to talk about what Brazil is going through a little bit in general to answer yeah. this question. Please, please do. Yeah, so I I have a really strange career, if you will, because I have made films and I have friends and have worked in every single continent apart from Antarctica. So I'm really used to working in my house or working in another country on another continent altogether. And so I, I kind of always have work. Again, this is the first time that I think we as a species are going through the same thing at once. Né? So, so mm -hmm. we are like 7 billion people going through this. 
So I was getting ready. Like I was getting ready. Like I'm used to do this, this job that I'm doing with the rapper here. It's, uh, it's, it's going to have a video output as well. So we are like taking video work. And I think I'm the only company that I know that like actually signed clients during the pandemic, you know, instead of like mm. laying off, I, I'm, I'm actually hiring people because I have more work. At the same time, on the filmmaking side, since our president got elected in 2016, he is destroying the culture part of the country, like the culture industries, all of the things he's doing. Because the way we usually make films here, it's kind of, which is kind of odd as well, it's kind of 100% government uh, based. So we have a lot of tax incentives, tax laws, tax breaks for companies, for people. The government gives you a lot of money to make films. And for the past 25 years, that's kind of 99% of the, of the filmmaking that you see from Brazil has some kind of government money. You, mm. Usually 100% of the funds for a movie comes from some kind of of tax breaks or ta or tax incentives or or some kind of, of a government law that's helping you make the film. So for the past two and a half years, these are being destroyed. So the the filmmaking industry in Brazil is going through a horrible phase in the production side, but at the same time the films that were already done are doing fantastic. So this was the biggest number of films we ever got in the Berlin Film Festival was this year. I think we got 13 mm. or 18 films showing mm. in the Berlin Film Festival. Uh, you have Bacurau from my friend Kleber Mendonça, who won Cannes last year. So, so Parasite won the biggest prize. Bacurau won, right. won the jury prize. You have, I think, every in every single festival in the past two years or two years and a half, three years maybe, you have Brazilian films winning some kind some kind of award, you know. So the industry is like creative is going great, but the health, the pulse of the industry is just dead. So mm -hmm. and the thing is, I specialize in doing low budget, fast kind of genre films. So if right. if it wasn't a pandemic right now, I was going to be in the pre-production of my next feature film. So like okay. so like for me personally, it's great, but for all of my friends, it's horrible. For for the industry, it's horrible, so, and it's gonna be way way worse because we won't have a fade in and fade out from the pandemic. You know, like the pandemic will end won't have any help and the whole industry I I don't I don't think like by next month that half of the production companies in Brazil will be open. Yeah, you think it just you think it just goes I mean it's so hard to say uh, if if like governments will step up and support some of these businesses if they even should support some of these businesses. Mm -hmm. I mean part of being an entrepreneur is taking that risk. And if you're not prepared to fail, but then that that gets into a whole nother level of economics and politics that I don't know if I even can realistically speak on mm -hmm. because I don't have that level of knowledge to understand that stuff. Um, I I wanted to ask about uh, filmmaking in Brazil in general and where do you think it comes from? It, this this fact that there seems to be like a very hotly burning passion right now to tell stories like you said all of these festivals accepting record numbers of entries from brazil people doing this like where, where do you think it comes from that that people in brazil want to tell these tales and have them be heard in this way yeah like brazil has a great i think the biggest one of the biggest problems and one of the biggest advantages advantages of brazil is that we speak portuguese so like portuguese mm -hmm. it's a really melodic narrative language you know uh like one and we have this close relationship with arts we are social people 
we like to go to places together to concerts to like every every day you can go to a samba party somewhere a traditional one that's going on for like 50 70 years you know so we are really social gathering storytelling people uh mm -hmm. on the on the filmmaking part there's like stories when when the photography was invented one of the guys who invented photography actually invented here in brazil in in campinas mm. which is a which is a city like an hour away from sao paulo was a priest so photography it's like invented was invented i think in two or three places at the same time one of the places mm -hmm. was here so like we are we are kind of all, always in the forefront of of the production so in the past, especially in the past 20 years i i think we as a count we are we started to have a possibility of production here in the whole country because one thing that a lot of people don't understand is that sao paulo is kind of europe in one country so like at the same time mm -hmm. that it's the size i think sao paulo city is the same size as, as some of of european countries just sao paulo city mm -hmm. has like 20 million people in the great in the greater sao paulo area so it's right. a lot of people and you and we have a lot of different geographies so if you go to the northeast it's like the beaches that you think when you think of brazil a lot of them is it's in the northeast of the country in the north you have the amazon in the south was colonized by german and dutch so it's a lot of of, of it's where like giselle Bündchen comes from they all look like the classic blonde blue eyed beauties of of <laughs> yesteryear, you know, classic beauty. Then you have São Paulo and the southeast, who are who are more like of a farmer, Portuguese, Spanish idea, and, and and visually, like the cities really look like Portuguese cities if you go to the old part of of town. So when the we had governments, especially in the early two thousands, that were giving people money and they could work with arts they could do stuff and and the technology was getting there you could buy uh from a mini dv camera back in the day to now uh even a red camera if you want you know like it's kind of affordable to have a professional high definition 4k 8k camera oh yeah certainly some people's phones do it yeah like like the my horror my my musical I did, Apple was my sponsor, and I shot the whole film on, on iPhones. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so because I wanted to show people that it was possible to have a filmic look, to make a film language in, in iPhones. It didn't matter the camera that you had. So with all of that, we are finally, a lot of people who couldn't manage to buy a 35 millimeter camera or, or even the stock film, you know, now they can make films. Yeah. So like Kleber Mendonça, for example. He's like the biggest, our biggest director right now. He was on the jury for the Berlin Film Festival, won Con last year, you know, all of these things. And he was a critic for a long time, for like 20 years, I think. Mm -hmm. And when the, and he's from the Northeast, which is, it's a historic, a poorer place than the Southeast where I am, Sao Paulo, Rio. So when this technology be, be, uh, just became available, he created a group of people. He was going to the festival. He was meeting a lot of filmmakers, and he just started doing. So like he did like I think ten short films, amazing short films, a lot of trial and error until he made his first feature film. I think ten or fifteen years after he did his first short film. Yeah. So that's why, and uh, and if you get our our literature if you get our, our music it's kind of always based on stories you know like the yeah. samba lyrics the uh, uh, Jorge Amado Clarice Inspector a lot of of our writers they are known worldwide Machado de Assis right so it's it's great story so now in the filmmaking I think it's a process you know like it's we are seeing the tipping point of a process that even though the government's not helping us we are finding ways to do it, especially the people who never well, had a voice. 
Right. It's like a democracy. This is something that's been going on for 10, almost 20 years now, this democratization of technology. Technology has come to a place to where anybody who wants can make a feature league film. Yes. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be immediately great or whatever. You still have to have some sort of technical know-how. But yeah, anyone who wants to can take their iPhone and point it at an actor and make a film. Yeah, I do a lot of workshops, especially like I take a lot of people under my wing, especially young people to help them do stuff. And what I what I usually say is so like if if you want to start to make films or do any audiovisual, it's more it's a language. So like it doesn't matter if you're writing, it doesn't matter if you're writing the computer, in a typing machine, in a pen, in a expensive Montblanc pen, you are writing. It's it's a language. You know like the verbs, right. the adverbs, the 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 vowels, it's 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 the same. It, it, it's better sometimes, it's faster in some ways, but it's the language. So if you learn the language, if you learn how to speak film, what is uh, over the shoulder, how to cut, access, how to frame, it doesn't matter sure. what you're doing like or how you're doing. It, the image can be way better if you have a great lens and camera. The image can be like crazy in a 60 frame, everything in focus if you have your cell phone. But it's film, you know? It's uh, it's yeah. going to be film. Like, in, if you're telling a good story, people will just forget yes. about it. Like, people will just, That's, they won't matter what it looks like. That's exactly right. And I, and I think that we've proven that now over and over and over again with, with things, especially, especially if you go digging around on the internet. There are so many things that a good story cuts through. But I feel like, though, also, we've known that for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Because we still go, we still go back and listen to uh, classic recordings, or or even like you know, I, I don't know. Maybe this isn't the best metaphor for it, but like Bach, mm -hmm. right? Like you go, you go back and listen to uh, an aria from Bach that's a you know several hundred years old at this point, and he's still telling a good story, and that's still why you hear it, and it can bring tears to your eyes because. Even musically, he's just telling a timeless story, and it doesn't matter the device that it was recorded on. It doesn't matter the piano that he played it on or the organ that he played it on. It's the story itself. The story itself lives through. Yeah, and so that's that's a very good point. Yeah, that's a thing that also I was really lucky in my life to have been to all of this of the countries that I have, all of the places that I have. And sometimes I was being told stories in language that I even I didn't even speak. So like I always remember being in the middle of, of, of Zimbabwe in Africa and watching in this small tribe this woman telling this 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 kids this story. And she was it was she was such a good storyteller that it was impossible not to be f fixated by her. You know, like she was using mm. her her whole body. When like she was talking about snakes, she uh, she just would like wave her her arms around and like pronouncing the <laughs> s's like like snakes, you know. And yeah. like even though I didn't speak the language they were speaking, I I was understanding everything because she was a good storyteller. She was telling me yeah. stories with more than just language. So so if you if you take Moser, if you take like even like J.K. Rowling today, you know, she like if you read Red Harry Potter, you might not like it, but you cannot say that it's not a good storyteller because she like got the whole world fixated, really in love with a magical kid wizard. So like you can yeah, you can only that's... do that if you can if you know how to tell a good story, and that's I think. The most important thing from a, from an interview standpoint, from a filmmaking standpoint, the podcast, a song, we are storytellers. If you, I think a lot of people who are listening to this already read like Yuval Harari, all of these guys, and the society. We as humans, we are only here because we tell stories to each other. We believe in stories, being God or money. Like these ideas, which are stories that we believe, being Star Wars, mm. uh, something that happened in a galaxy far, far away, you know, a long time ago. Yeah. So like it's all based on stories. So if you know how to hack the stories in a way, 
how if you understand the shape of a story, there's a great YouTube video of, of Kurt Vonnegut talking about the shape oh. of stories. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, it's... Amazing, so, amazing. So, like, it's an amazing storyteller. If you if you read Slaughterhouse-Five or any of his books, you know how, of a, how much of a great storyteller he is. So, like, it's these little things, you know? So, it doesn't matter. I always tell people it doesn't matter the technical side. The technical side will get there. But uh, if you know the basic, the, the, the skeleton... Then the muscle, then the, the then the skin will get done. Yeah, yeah, it's very very good, very true. That's the mic drop quote of the episode right there. Tell good stories, and the rest will get done. It's <laughs> <Just> like <doom. laughs> let it out. Uh, I want to I want to I want to shift gears a little bit because I do want to give platform uh, for a very very big thing that I know that you're involved with, which I find super interesting and super super relevant right now. Um, which is uh, AOS though. Yes. And I, I want to give you the opportunity to explain to people what is AOS though and what is going on right now because we're all in an unprecedented time in the world with, uh, with all this going on. But uh, talk to me about AOS though. This is one of the biggest interests that I have in what you're up to right now. Okay, so AOS though, which translates to I am or I am feeling, uh, it's a project, it's like a collective, I would say, or a project. I don't know how to describe what we are. But the idea was to create a place, on, especially on social networks, where we could talk about mental health pr uh, promotion. So I have a really deep interest in how how the internet, how how these big companies even are dealing with us, how they are like a new type of power and and how they are reading us better than a lot of, uh, of, of psychiatrists are. So what I did was I in this in during carnival, so in February uh, two years ago uh, of 2018, I got a, a, a panic attack. I was partying in the streets surrounded by thousands of people and I got a, a panic attack. And then I managed to, because I was already doing a lot of work on myself and I managed to get into the car, drive home. But in that night, I had a really quick and intense desire to commit suicide. So it was really mm. fast, was really intense and it marked me forever so like because even i that it, that i'm happy i have everything on the on the material side i'm working with what i want i know a lot of people i was dating this beautiful girl at the time i had everything and i had this desire to to just end my life and i remember the surf lesson that i had years ago where this 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 instructor told me, if you are ever stuck in a really bad tide, just let it go. Don't fight against it. Because if you fight against it, you get tired and you draw. But if you just let it go, the tide will come around and it will make you go to, to shore or some stone where you can just hold yourself. Or like a calmer part of the sea. So I did that. I managed to do that. And when I woke up on the next day... I decided to do something and understand what I was doing because I believe we all we all have superpowers and my superpower is have being a storyteller. So I wanted to understand what happened to me and how I could make this knowledge known to more people, how I could tell this this story. Uh a week later, I was uh, I went to a bar with some friends of mine, a musician friend, a really famous musician friend here and a really the first big youtuber here in brazil and this youtuber was really bad as well and we did a thing that we males 30 something males like millennials we don't do that we open up emotionally to each other we just talked and i told him what happened to me he told me what was what, happening to him and we decided to create something together so, like, his name is P.C. Siqueira. 
And in the beginning was just to make a series of videos on his YouTube channel or even one video talking about mental health. But talking more with people, I, will, I, I went after a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists to understand where this came from. And I met what who would later become our, our technical advisor. Her name is Dr. Karin Scavacini. And she is the biggest uh, people who works with communication of mental health, especially suicide prevention and postvention. That is the postvention. It's what you do after it happens or after someone tries. So right. talking with her, I saw that it was something even bigger that we had to deal with. And I do a, I do a thing that I always go to tech companies here in Brazil to steal uh, to steal food. So I have a lot of friends who works at Google, who works at Facebook, and every time I'm around them uh, during lunchtime or like for a coffee break, I call them and I and these companies usually have great food in their offices. Mm -hmm. So I just say, oh, you know that ad or that data that, that you sold from me. That's going to be my lunch today. So I'm going up there and I'm going to have lunch. And then they usually yeah. just invited me up. So I was having lunch on Facebook and I saw a friend of mine and we do a lot of things together. And he just did a company for, for AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. So mm -hmm. she just worked with Facebook and AA to do something. I say, hey, Steve, you're going to help me do this. And then we... Kind of, man, I managed to work to, to convince Facebook to give me money. So I didn't work for, for like the whole year. And together with Facebook, we mapped a lot using big data, using a lot of stuff, how to talk with people using social networks. So in the end, we did 12 hero videos that we call. We did 12 longer videos. Who, who, are, who is like a deep dive on mental health, especially on suicide in the, in the first wave when we launched. And in, the, in these 12 videos, these are like five to 10 minute videos, we managed to do after 120 pieces of content. And these 120 pieces wow. of content we released in, in the first three months. So we have comics, we have just just like a 15 second video. We have just like phrases that you can read. So it doesn't matter which part of a crisis you are or if you want to help someone, there's like content for you there. Like content mm. from, we had three pillars to create all of the content. So the pillars were, we needed to, to demystify, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the English word. Demystify? Yeah. The what is mental health? We need to 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 teach people to to give them yeah. support, even if they are sick or if they need or if they need to help someone else. And we need to 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 educate people mm -hmm. on what was happening. So all of the contents have these three pillars on them. Some are more based on support, or there's more in education, but they all have these three pillars. And it's me, PC, and, and Dr. Karin speaking the video in that way, is like in a straight manner, we go and say, so it's better uh, to have a mad friend than a dead friend. So if you know your mm -hmm. friend is trying to commit suicide or want to commit suicide, talk to someone, even if it's him. You know, like if him doesn't or her doesn't want to talk to you, talk to someone else, but mm -hmm. help him. He's he needs help from like how to start a conversation, how to ask for help, where to ask for help. So we are like showing there is a door, but like this door you have to cross. And we treat it as like an advertising campaign in a way. So we had Facebook gave us a lot of money to buy advertisement in their in their services. We based this campaign especially because we wanted to talk with young people on Instagram, but we are also using WhatsApp and Facebook. And by the mm -hmm. end of the first wave, 
we had reached a tenth of the population of Brazil. So we had reached tw more than 20 million people with our content. So people wow. like, and we were receiving like photos and videos and thanks from people like in the deep in the Amazon, people who are like joining together for the first time and sh and watching watching our videos, you know, like as a group to try, uh, like a support group to help them get out of a, of whatever they were feeling. We had stories of of people of women who met in the in the comment sections of the content. And they created a WhatsApp group to help them get out of abusive relationships. We have churches mm -hmm. and priests come to us and say that they, for the first time, understood that it wasn't a lack of God in the hearts of their of their perishers and how they now can help them more. You know, mm -hmm. we have kids with with highly religious parents or like parents who didn't believe they were sick or they had a depression and they sat down with their parents and show our content and they and they finally understood what the kid was going through so it was like the job of a lifetime and the most beautiful thing is that for for Facebook to help us was like the first time i think they ever did something like that we became a benchmark mm. Uh, the Facebook system, when you buy like ads on Facebook, the system gives you a rating, and I I I used to do that a lot, you know, with with my agency clients, even my clients, to see how was how the ad was performing, and it was like the biggest ad I've ever seen, even on Facebook, the biggest rating they ever seen the system give was like a five. <laughs> Out of 10 wow. for like a McDonald's campaign during the World Cup, you know, like for like our Coca-Cola during the Olympics. So like give here is like have a free Coke with friends watching football or whatever. Right. We did right. 15 or no, 20 campaigns. Our our base, our medium, our average was eight, you know, from like Oof. all of the campaigns with a lot of them reaching 10. So people were engaging, people were sharing, people were liking, and that was beautiful. We and so like the KPI of the campaign, so like our base of the campaign, especially on Facebook, who has big data, you know, like, was like, they really wanted to reach a lot of people. And I always said to them, no, this, this thing that we are doing, more than reach millions of people, which we ended up doing, was... We have, if we ever receive one message from one person saying, I wanted to kill myself, I was in a really bad place, and I saw your content, and I decided to give a second shot, that is our metric. That is what, that's our yeah. goal. We Save one life. Yeah, like, it's one person. In the, we launched the, our profiles, at our, our first teaser went in the air on September 12th, 2018. It was just a teaser saying that on it, it, it was a Thursday, that on the next Tuesday, we are going to start to release the videos. On Saturday night, that weekend, we received our first message of a 13-year-old girl who wrote exactly that. I was trying to kill myself. I wanted to kill myself. I met you guys in what was supposed to be the last day of my life and I decided to give another another shot. And I talked to you right now. It, was, it wasn't even like you hadn't done anything. anything. It was just a teaser. It was at a this teaser point. trailer. So like I'm talking to you right now almost crying oh. goosebumps again because it was the first time that I realized the the potency of what we are doing. You know, like when I do a movie and it doesn't work. It's like less tickets sold. It's less market sold or whatever. If I do a advertising or whatever, and it doesn't work, it's less products that we sell. But this, if I did something wrong or if I did something right, was I was talking about human life, you know? Yeah. 
Uh, yeah. That that week I went crazy. I went crazy. Like it was even worse than the and then the panic attack that started it all. That week was even worse yeah. because to have this impact in a person's life, I I don't think people are ready for it. So like I understand what a lot of the presidents are what's happening in, in the in the head and the hearts of a lot of of uh, politicians right now because yeah we are talking about human life and this this girl she was a 13 year old girl and if she killed herself I, i'm talking here of a family of uh of a neighborhood of a school of a small city that she lived in like her death would yeah. have like ripples throughout hundreds of people And just watching a simple 30-second video of us talking, saying, you are not alone, she felt touched and she felt a will to keep going, you know? Yeah. So that, for me, was what changed my life forever. So since then, every single piece of thing that I've done, I've done because of that and with that in mind. Like, how, how can I have this potency? How can I help this person people a community help each other and how i can use this the systems being a, a a google hangout like we are right now being instagram right. being in whatsapp how can i create content that's going to reach this person whatever they are it's going to be like kind of invisible so one of the things that we worked really close together with facebook was how to best approach creating content for their platform So mm -hmm. what was working, what was not working with other people creative. So like for Instagram, for example, we, we learned that people usually don't see videos on Instagram with sound because they are, you know, like just like scrolling through, they are in the line, they are in the bus, they are in the school, they're in work and they don't have their headphones. Yeah, they got their headphones in. They're, they got their headphones in. They're listening to a podcast. They're not listening to exactly. Instagram. And they're just scrolling away. So, like, we needed to have subtitles. And we are talking about really intense stuff. So, if you see our videos, our subtitle became part of the design of the video. It's, like, really big, bold letters in the middle of the video. So, it's just, like, our faces. Another thing that, that we do a, did a lot of tests. Usually people are seeing these videos on cell phones. And on cell phones, I'm talking to one person. So if I'm talking to one person, all of our language was in the, in the singular, was never in the plural. So it was like you as a person, not you as a, as a group. So like you are, are important. You were not alone. And we were looking at the camera. We were looking at the lens talking yeah. to you. So like it's our faces talking to you with big bold letters in the screen. You know, so that also was an inclusive thing that we wanted to do for for the deaf and blind and and blind communities, mm -hmm. but it was important because that was what what how people consume things on Instagram. So yeah. in the end, it was like a perfect storm, you know, of what to do, how to do it, and now we are starting our third wave. So our second wave was we we interviewed survivors uh, as suicide su suicide survivors so a, a suicide survivor it's not only people who try to kill themselves and not go through with it or doesn't have a successful attempt but also the people who are left behind so left behind yeah so because they su they survived a suicide so mm -hmm. we interview uh 12 people, I think, or eight people. And there's like a priest who tried to kill him f to who tried to kill himself five times. You have uh, a girl who tried to kill herself because she she flunked math when she was 12 and she jumped out of a window mm -hmm. and now she's paying the price un until now. She's like almost 30 years old. You have mothers who lost their daughters. You have uh, parents who lost their a daughter because me the the medical professionals didn't treat them right. You know, mm -hmm. like because the kid tried to commit a suicide. Why 
they were going to help someone who wanted to die. So like the kid died because he was mistreated in, in the in the hospital. And we wanted to do that to show people that it suicide it doesn't have a face. It can help to a priest. It can help to a 12-year-old girl. And you're not alone. What you're feeling, it's what a lot of people in the world are feeling right now. So you can yeah. talk to each other, especially with the technology we are having right now in our hands. You can just talk to people, even strangers, and they are going to be there for you. So, well, I, and, it, and now the third wave, we are doing this project with the rapper. So it's how right. we can empower mental health and even physical health in the favelas and in the poorest part of the country. Hmm. I guess it, one thing that jumps to my mind that I, I feel like I want to say, and I want to, I want to pivot this conversation a little bit to current events is, is ultimately where I'm headed. But one of the things that jumps up into my mind as I hear you tell that story is I can't help but think to myself uh, about the numbers. And, and it's weird to put it in these terms. Like I don't want to call it the success of the campaign mm -hmm. because we're talking about people's lives, but it is a great success uh, that you reached, you know, this massive, massive number of people. But my brain jumps up and it says, well, that number means two things. One, it, it is a testament to the quality of the campaign, you know, the effort mm -hmm. that you put into the video and, and the effort that went into getting it spread and getting it seen. But there's also a dark side to that number, which is this is this is a representative number of how many people needed to hear this message. Exactly. And and that's just I mean, I'm a little bit leveled. You you said before that you were immediately getting emotional talking about it. I'm getting emotional hearing mm -hmm. you speak about it because it just draws into such a clear perspective like how big this number is of people who struggle with living with themselves every day yeah i and think there's a like i learned a lot during this 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 process like every day was a new learn a lesson every like a learning curve or something and one of the things that like i learned is that the system the the narrative that we are living. It's a really individual, uh, like, lonely narrative. The nar the, uh, I, uh, like, I don't want to pinpoint to uh, the American way of life, but the American ideals, you know, the post-war ideals of, of capitalism, of whatever we are living right now, it's lonely. And we are a social mm -hmm. species. So, like, we need people around. We need to work together. We need, like, a way to change stories, to change feelings, to hug, to feel hormones, to look at each other's mm. eyes. So, but that was getting apart because we needed to work. We need to have three jobs just to get by. We need to, to work overnight or didn't have time for our loved ones and whatever. So mm. there's a lot of this that are happening. And at the same time, I am an optimist. So I think a lot of people were listening to us and I do a, uh, a comparison to what the LGBT community was, went through the 70s, 80s and 90s, you know, like mm. was like you couldn't, like the gay was a, the butt of a joke to be gay. Right. Then was like all, all of our artists are gay and they are in society to now the CEO of the biggest company in the world is gay and it's fine. You know, like I uh, like gay marriage and it, it's not fine per se. Like we still have a lot of, of, of homophobia and everything, but like it's getting better. You know, like mm -hmm. it's it, it's normalized as we were saying at the beginning of the conversation. So I mm. think mental health, it has to be normalized. Everybody has been sick for millennia. You know, like you see all of the big artists of our time or like for since the dawn of time, probably that they had some time of mental health issue to be locked down, oh, yeah. to have a deep feeling, to have to put it out. A lot of them kill themselves. And even even nowadays we connect né? Uh, a lot of the mental health that we go to the suffering of arts, it's be, it's pretty to suffer, to write a poem or a song, to be addicted. Mm. You know, like I want to die uh. by by the time I'm 27, 
to uh, to join Kurt Cobain and and whatever whoever whoever else died by when they were 27 but it it sucks imagine living with that kind of pain imagine living with that whoever is living with you you know like to live with someone who's who have that kind of pain and suicide in the end it's a way to end the pain and it's such a great a huge pain that you are feeling that the only way that you can end that pain is ending the root of the pain that it's yourself so when you are in the uh close to commit suicide you're just feeling pain and right now doesn't matter if you are left wing right wing if you are a capitalist or socialist we are all in pain we are all broken we need to find a new narrative and that's why me and a lot of my friends who are studying this what is happening right now uh, philosophers and, and and political studies and everything we came to this conclusion that we are all broken and we are in the cusp and i think the virus right now it's going to push this really fast uh, of how we right. can come out on the other side with a new narrative with a new idea because we are polarized because we need to feel seen and we might be feel seen and in a group that it's homophobic and racist and horrible to people but along with those people i'm part of a group or we can be part of the group who is starting to fix all of that but we are part of a group yeah. nonetheless so we are trying to do that so that's a huge part of what we are going through and what is being put in check in these times of of quarantine and being locked down yeah yeah i mean i'm i'm just all openly admit that i'm kind of all over the place uh hearing you talk about this as somebody who has lost people in my life uh good friends who have taken their own lives have not been able to uh to find their way through it um but in, in the in the efforts of wanting to continue to to explore this information and to share this information, I want to know. Sorry, I apologize for myself. Uh, I, I want to know. Um, I want to know what you're seeing now. Obviously, the we are in an unprecedented time, and I'm sure that people all over are feeling new feelings mm -hmm. and pressures that they've never experienced before, emotions that they may have never experienced before. Uh, senses of isolation, senses of loss. Are you seeing this reflected? Are people reaching out to AOSO in in massive numbers? Are people reaching out to you uh, to share you as a resource? Like, like what are you seeing as a direct impact of this quarantine situation, of this lockdown situation, uh, as far as something that is hands on dealing with men people's mental health states? Yeah, like for me, one of the reasons that I've that I've been working a lot. Uh, and first, the, don't feel sorry or don't ask sorry for what you are feeling right now, Matt, because I think it's beautiful, you know, like that we have loved ones, that we can feel this stuff, that we can share this message to people. That's really important. Like we were losing a lot of contact. We were losing a lot of those emotions because we needed to be productive. We need to be serious. We need to do stuff. And one of the things that the quarantine is bringing, it's time. time. It's time to feel. It's time to be with ourselves. Time to be with ourselves. And being with ourselves, it's horrible sometimes. You know, because you keep second guessing, you keep seeing nasty sides of what you are, of what you, you can be. Especially when there's death together. Because we have a really unhealthy i'm saying specifically the western hemisphere has a pretty unwealthy relationship with death you know like mm -hmm. we were taught from the christian judaic ideals how death is the end how death is suffering how you can go to hell if you do some if you kill yourself or or if you are not well behaved and this is more like in the end, this is more like, a, you, if you study, it's more like a social dynamic of controlling huge amounts of people than actually true. Like, if even there's a religion that I love, that it's the, the Swindenborgians, 
and it's uh, and it's a guy Emmanuel Swindenborg who who was the late a Renaissance man and he got invited by Jesus himself to write what actually happens when you die so like he I think it's the 1800s Jesus appears and say everything that people are saying is wrong you are the most intelligent person living right now so I give you free reign to explore the heaven and hell go and he comes back and he says heaven is an idea heaven is a state of mind mm. no he heaven and hell whatever happens on the other side is another thing altogether so like w w yeah. we have a really unhealthy relationship with, with death and right now what is happening is that we need to spend time with ourselves we need to spend time with other people and as Camus said other people are hell <laughs> So like mm. living with someone in a locked space and seeing every quirky of the of that person, you know, you are not well, that person is not well. It can be daunting. It can be a massive undertaking doing that. And every single thing that used to be us, our work, our commute, our our hangings with with friends, our restaurants are no more and won't be once we come out of this. Things will be different. So the the panic, I would say, of the not panic, but the the wave of the pandemic that's hitting harder. And it's gonna hit for a long time. It's gonna be of how we blew, we lost the world. We are living through the end of the world and the world as a narrative, the world as an idea. And every single idea, it's ego, it's ourself. So if we, if you are a podcaster and you lose that, you lose a part of yourself. I'm talking with your ego. I'm talking with whatever you understand as part of you. And that's what is dying. So whoever is committed suicide was... you sometimes or most of the times are having problems with that part of the of, of themselves you know like whatever is hurting deep inside and sometimes we can help mm -hmm. them sometimes we can't and that's why why post is so important because we can make people understand that it's not their fault that th that person died and it's not our fault that a lot of people are gonna die by coronavirus you know uh but this is a problem. Coronavirus, I think, is showing us that this is a problem that was created by an individual. So whoever ate the meat that was contaminated in China and got sick for the first time, and now the whole world is locked down. So yeah. we live in a really interlocked system. Uh, being the system of humans, being the system of nature... Uh, with other species, with everything. So if we take this time to understand that, to understand that this is a collective problem, that only a collective solution will work. We are not going out, not only for us to not get sick, but so other people won't get sick because of us. So like mm -hmm. probably 80% of, of, of the population will get sick, like half of humans will get sick. Three billion humans, individuals who are get sick. Most of those people won't even have flu-like symptoms, but ten percent will die because those people had or didn't have symptoms. So yeah. we need to think collective, and with the technology we have, with the systems that we have in place, it's gonna crash. You know, like it's gonna bump heads because we have a system an idea, uh, a story that is based on the individual. We need to hoard money. We need to hoard resources. We need to be the best podcaster, the, VIP, the VP of the company, the best influencer or whatever, when we can just create a community and be good with the community, when it's just enough, you know? So I think in these changing times, these ideas is going to be what people are going to go through like a socialism of feeling 
in a way you know mm. like of an emo- emotional socialism nice yeah of of how we can connect with other people and that's why you know like zoom it's a a, a system that you can talk to other people remotely and have hundreds of people in the same call because now people are missing something that was always always there and you know yeah well and it was it was always there before like zoom is not invented day two of the quarantine you know that that those devices those tools to communicate with each other have always been in place we've just never utilized them in this way and it it, it took it took a disaster to bring us all together, which is a tragic thing. Yes. And even still, we're not all coming together. We're, we're not there yet, but it at least got a lot of us talking about it and thinking about it in a new way. But it took something near catastrophic, if, if not catastrophic, actually, to bring us back to ourselves and to bring us back to each other. And this realization that... Yeah, you know, you can post a picture of yourself on Instagram and it can have 1.6 million likes or whatever. But like those people are not going to bring a loaf of bread to your house when you're starving and you can't go outside because you're sick and, uh, you know, you're locked down because there's a curfew. Like it's I I feel like it's an opportunity for a lot of us to shake off the superficial Mm -hmm. and get back to the the, the things that are real, the things that are solid inside of ourselves and inside of the world and the community that we each inhabit because all the superficial has kind of gone away by force. Exactly. So like what you said, there's a lot of of a success things that uh, a success ideals that we have and a lot of things that we connected, I think, in the wrong way. So, like the idea of money, of how money, money in the last hundred years, more so, more so since the in the between war times and especially in the post Second War time, became almost a essential part of the human existence, along with air, along with mm-hmm. food, along with water. Uh, so, like, if you don't have money, when, when, and it. And I really like to study language to see how people relate with certain things. So, like, when a person doesn't have a job, they are going to starve to death because they don't have a job and because they are not earning money. Uh, when, when, in English, you say a means of a living, you know, like for when, uh, or, or like a living wage when you're talking about money, but it's... Right, but, but like money, it's like the money has to come first. Yes, but it doesn't. So like the yeah. the, the indigenous people, they are living without money and they are doing fine. Like we disconnected <laughs> with the natural world, so the money is not important. What is important? It's what we do with the money. It's like an easier access to food, to water, and to shelter. That is the things that the natural things that we need to keep going. So. So, like, if we start to change our way of thinking, so I'm, 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 I'm feeling this with a lot of my close friends. Naturally, I, I think artists they have like this antenna that are capturing stuff before in the in the collective unconscious first. So, a lot of my friends in the past five years or so, we always started to plant stuff in our houses. To 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 mm-hmm. plant produce in our houses, we started to look places to to buy like land in the countryside where we can have a more sustainable farm and and whatnot, you know. And it was like a natural process of us looking at each other and saying, "It's not our songs we're gonna feed us. It's not the money's gonna feed us. It's like if we understand that it's it comes from the land." It comes from this world, mm-hmm. and we are in a symbiose uh, relationship with everything. And money is just the idea. Yeah. It's, a, it's a facilitator. It's not the, the goal, you know, like it's a means to an end. It's not the end, per se. Yeah. So, uh-huh. and, and there's, there was a quote that I saw on the internet by the daughter of the ex-president for the Santander Bank in Spain. Uh, he died from from COVID, and she said, yeah. "Like we are a family who has a lot of money, but my my father died alone, grasping the 
one thing that we couldn't buy that was air. Yeah. So like it's simple as that. You know, like this virus is taking one of the most important things that it's air out of our lungs. You know, so we if we started to pay attention, it's gonna be a tough change. Like you you have the United States trying to do a coup in Venezuela, so war is coming, you have Hungary. Is starting to go in a dictatorship. You have a lot of these things happening during the pandemic. Things are going to get a, a lot worse in the pandemic as well before it gets better, before we do have a vaccine. But on the other side, I, I really, truly believe that people is gonna, are going to wake up to all of these small things, being that you need to take care of your body, your mental health. So if this happens again, you're ready. Or if you go through something as, as traumatic or as intense as this, you can do this. You're going to pay attention and have compassion for the other person. And you're going to have courage to change. And mm -hmm. this, I think, it's, a, it's the basis of what we are doing right now with the content we are creating for the favelas. And there's a quote that I always usually end my conversations, but I think this is the, per it's the perfect moment to add, is that... If if everybody shines a little bit, we can become a constellation, and nobody yeah. can put this light out. So if if you don't need to do much, if in this moment you can just take care of yourself, if you can take care of an older uh, of an older person in your family, uh, on, on your neighborhood, in your building a block, if you can take care of your friends, call them. Talk to them, send food to them if they don't have money, you know, like buy takeout or like a supermarket and, and like essentials and, and drop to them. If we can shine just a little bit, like a tiny, tiny bit, this light is going to become so bright that the other side is going to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I hope so, man. I can, I can't, I can't, I, I can't agree with that any stronger than I, I do now. And, um, in, in that spirit, and I know that we're going to go long on this conversation, longer than normal, but I, I don't care because it's just, it's so uh, nice and refreshing to to be able to connect and communicate within you this with you in this way. And I, I want to ask about you. We've talked for now almost an hour now mm -hmm. about the work that you've done and and projects and everything like that. But honestly, at this point, it doesn't really feel. I, it's important, but it's not really relevant. And I, I just feel myself, I want to ask how you are doing. Like, you are obviously a human being. You are in mm -hmm. this place. Uh, you are in Sao Paulo. You are also in quarantine. Brazil is going through some craziness yes. uh, with uh, Bolsonaro mm -hmm. and, and all this insane stuff that the government there is doing. How How are you doing? Yeah, so like, I'm going to divide myself in the physical and mental part, even though it's two things. So okay. uh, on the physical part, I'm not doing really well because I got hepatitis. So mm. well, which I'm saying is the best and the worst time I could ever got a virus disease was in, during these times because I have to... Boy, there's no, there's no joke, right? Yeah, because I had to stay home. I, I have the lighter, the easier hepatitis that there is, which is a food poisoning hepatitis. But at the same time, it sucks. You you get to like you get dizzy and lazy and and it. I, I was supposed to get hospitalized two weeks ago. I couldn't because the, the hospital was already overflowing with COVID. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah, the doctor didn't want to to put me in a hospital if I didn't need to, if I wasn't in pain or you know needed some actual death, uh, life threatening conditions. So I'm I'm, I'm right. taking care of home, but at the same time I've been kind of kind of getting ready for a moment like this for a long long time. Like uh, I've been working a lot. I I was really lucky to meet a lot of people throughout my years that we we think alike and we we realize that the way we were living wasn't sustainable. So. Mm. I understood that I needed to take care of myself when this moment happened. I I I really thought that the, the, this moment was going to happen 
in like five to six to 10 years time, like what's going to happen in the 2020s, but in a later date, not in, not, at, not in the first month of the new decade, as we are living <laughs> right now. <laughs> I, you know, like, oh, cry. I really thought it was going to be in this decade, but not literally in the beginning, <laughs> in the first day oh, of man. it. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, like I've been taking care. I, I, I have a one hour and a half uh, routine that I do in the morning where like I used to do Pilates and yoga in a studio close by. Now I'm doing what I can, in, especially with the hepatitis in, in home, uh, here in my home. I do a, a meditation that changed my life. I do a breathing exercise that changed my life. Uh, I take a cold shower, you know, like I do uh, fasting. So I usually eat around lunchtime only and I finish eating at five. I lost 65 kilos in the last 10 years, five, five to six years. So like I'm really taking care of myself and especially Eusto. Eusto make me really... Uh, resilient. So sometimes I lo I lose the English words, but really makes me that's okay. Like ready to what was happening because when two years ago I started getting please uh, uh, like really desperation messages, uh, desperate messages from like kids as young as nine years old wanting to f end their lives. Like you, you need had like I had to had my Buddha under the tree moment, and that and that was that mm -hmm. week that I got that the message from that girl, you know, of like I was with my psychiatrist and my psychologist, my a priest friend of mine, they were all helping me go through this week, and in the end, on the other side, when I got through, it was like an uh, a, a enlightenment moment. Of that, I'm only showing the door. I can only show the door. If the, what this person chooses to do with that information, with that door, is their choice. So right now, yeah. I'm my mind's really like ready to not ready because it sucks. I lost four people, like close by people, to COVID just last week. Shit, I'm sorry. You know, to hear so like uh, like family members from really close friends. Uh, so it's been real and I've been but at the same time I like to say even though I worked in Hollywood I work in like in big movies and I've done a lot of this stuff the way I chose to be in Brazil is that I, I had this feeling that I was going to be needed during some chaos and, and, and Brazil has been in chaos for the last 500 years so Mm -hmm. So like one of the ways that I, I I am here was like I was getting ready for this moment and it's here. So I need to perform. So that's why I've been like having amazing conversations with companies of how they can help, how can can what they can do, what where they can even like donate money, like not even doing a PR stunt. Just how they can take care of their employees, how they can help the civil society, what we can do together, who can can work with to do stuff. So it's been intense. Like I I have especially that I I really need to balance the energy expenditure with me healing from the hepatitis. But it's been yeah. but but it's been great. I mean, how about you? Uh you know I don't I don't it's hard to say. It's hard to say because, uh, you know, somebody who is a fairly independent person anyway and dealing in the world of podcasting and trying to tell stories, that's a pretty pretty individualist lifestyle. You do a lot of listening and then a lot of uh, sharing uh, in response. And in this regard, when we are separated from people, I find that Many things come to me and my initial response uh, may be to want to share it. And then I turn and I realize, oh, yeah, we are in a time to where it's not so easy mm -hmm. to share uh, with your friends anymore or, or with your loved ones. You have to go through extra steps. And even then we are separated from each other. So 
I am feeling uh, myself quite a bit of isolation. Um, but I also feel this motivation to keep on going because uh, in a bit the way that you were saying, I think those of us that have a voice, those of us that have a platform, uh, you know, like this show is not such a huge thing. It's just some way that I can reach out into the world and, you know, people will hear it and maybe it affects some people or, or not. But it does give me a voice and it does give me a platform. Mm -hmm. And those of us, I think that those of us who are in this position, we have an obligation. And I've said this before um, when I've had guests on who have been uh, victims of uh, like sexual assault mm -hmm. or victims of crimes and everything. It's like those of us that have a voice, we need to speak up. Yeah, We need to share the crimes and we need to share the hurt and we need to share the names uh, of those that are hurting us. And in that way, we can all rally together. And so, yeah, I mean, my show changed, mm -hmm. you know, to talk about this stuff because I think that these are important stories to tell now. Yeah. And I'm, I, I myself, I, I can only say right now that I'm very honored uh, that I could share your voice. Thank you. Uh, and that you would have the time to come on the show and with your mind and your heart and your voice communicate with the people that hear this show because just as you said, you're talking with major brands and you're out there on the front lines. And I think from even just this hour-long conversation, I can easily say that a mind like yours and a heart like yours are exactly what we need in this time on the front lines. I, I think that these are the stories that people need to know and to to share is that there are people like you out there who are working to find the right way to be there for when we come out the other side, because eventually we will come out the other side of this. And I'm with you. I'm, I'm, I hope that one day I can stand right there shoulder to shoulder uh, beside you and say that, yeah, when we all came out of it, we came out of it as a community. We came out of it together mm -hmm. and not as individuals and apart. So yes, yeah, so I know we went a little bit long, uh, I, I want to. I want to personally, deeply. This conversation got a little bit more difficult for me than I was <laughs> expecting it to. But, um, but yeah, I am. I am just so flattered and honored right now that I've had this opportunity to talk with you. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Marcel, for taking the time to come and be on my show. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Matt, for having me. Thank you for the kind words. I think we have to share. We have to talk. We need to, as I said before, doesn't matter if one piece, one person get touched by this, uh, if it's only us, if it's whatever, how many uh, listeners will get influenced by this. But it's important because these make ripples. These are seeds that we are planting. Yeah. Who, whatever time it takes, will create beautiful forests and beautiful nature together. So this is important that we are talking that we are connecting in an international level because this is a message we are one we are one species yep. doesn't matter the color of the skin doesn't matter what you think how you feel the what language you speak we are one and again one person ate the wrong meat in china last year and in six months time the world changed so Right. We are connected. So if we can do the opposite, well, and I, <laughs> and I, and I would even add to that. I think that that situation of that person eating that thing that was that that ultimately originated making them sick or whatever that wasn't their fault. It wasn't their fault at you know, all. They didn't like society pushed them into a situation to where that was a choice that made sense for them at that time. Like I need to eat, and yeah. Like you were saying before with the shining light, like there are seven and a half billion people in this world. If we can all shine 1% brighter or if we can all be 1% kinder, or even just a fraction of that, just, you know, even, even to one person in our day, one person that we meet, complete stranger on the street, that we, we give them a smile instead of a scowl. Yep. But you multiply that by 7.5 billion, and then what? what is the world that we live in at that point? Like, when it's that 1% better? Exactly. Ah. Like, we don't need to do much. We don't need to even change much. It's just that it's going to be, uh, just like the spread of this virus, it's an incremental and logarithmic mix. I don't know math well. Like, think that if you, as you said, if one person smiles to the other, and this other person smiles to the other, and... Like, the whole world's going to smile together at some point. 
So I'm an optimist. Whatever you need to talk again, I'm here in a personal and a, in a podcast level. Uh, whoever is listening yeah. to this, my DMs are always opening. I'm always trying to reach to people to do the best well, I can. And tell people how. So Take this opportunity now. Instagram, Facebook, uh, all of that. Yeah, you can you can search for me at mm two letters m Isidoro I Z I D O R O uh, on Instagram, Twitter, everything together mm Isidoro one thing on Facebook I think it's mm Isidoro mm uh, space Isidoro but you can Google me it's easy uh, I'm always open. I usually talk in Portuguese, but I'm doing a lot of English content as well. Eu estou is already traveling. F Facebook is implementing in Chile and other countries. So there's going to be like mm -hmm. native content in other, pe other people's language. If you want to do what we did, it's uh, we are teaching a lot of people how to do it. I'm doing a lot of talks in ad agencies, companies, to in, in influencers and creators Uh, gatherings so people can do what we did and learn what we learned. So if you want to talk, if you want to learn, if you want to do something, or if you want to just ch chat, it's there. Uh, if you're listening to this, I'm going to ask you something on Instagram. I actually create a filter that it's, I 3D scan myself and I animated me dancing as I actually got to see this, by the way. I saw yeah, this earlier today. So It's fantastic. if you want to take me out dancing on your place, just do it, whatever you are listening to this at, <laughs> and just tag me. Because as I'm here in my house, I can't go out, and I really want to go out dancing, and I really want to travel again. So take me out dancing with you. <laughs> That's going to be a great way for us to start a beautiful, beautiful relationship. I love it. I love it. One of the things that you said in our pre-interview that stuck with me and uh, also with Steph, uh, our associate producer, um, was you, you had a great line. And I don't know if you intended it this way or if it was just something that you tossed off at the moment. But you said that we are, in a way, at the beginning of a mental revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that's very, very true. And I think that everything that we've talked about so far uh, leads to that. Like, this is really an opportunity for us to look at how we look at the world, how we think about the world and how we think about each other in the world. And I really hope, I really hope that conversations like you and I have had and conversations like I'm sure that you and I will continue to have in the future, um, help people to find that kickoff point for their own personal revolution, because we're all in this together. And I think that this situation reminds us of exactly that, that we are all in this together. Yes, that's it. And, I'm, and again, guys, it's going to pass. We're going to come out on the other side right now. If you need to talk, talking is the best thing that you can do for yourself. Expressing how, what you're feeling, being honest with yourself, with the other person. Because it's going to pass. No, nobody in the history of the world has been, go, has been through what we are going through right now with the tools that we have right now. And nobody in the history mm -hmm. of the world is you. So I don't know what you're feeling. You don't know what I'm feeling. You haven't been through my shoes. I've never been go through your shoes. So, so just be honest. Just be well. Find the best thing that works for you. But 80% of the time, just talking with another human, just having a conversation. Just And, and you don't need to, convert to, to talk about yourself or what you're feeling. You can talk about video games. You can talk about movies. You can talk about what you miss in the world right now. But talk, let it out. Have yeah, a sometimes I would say sometimes you don't even you don't even necessarily have to talk. Sometimes it's okay to simply listen as well. And I think that that's why I keep doing what I'm doing uh, with these conversations because you and I can talk, and maybe somebody just needs to sit and hear it. And I don't know. That's what keeps me motivated to to keep going. Is maybe somebody needs to hear this stuff. Exactly. So thank you very much, Matt, for having uh -huh. me. And whatever you no, want. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely, man. I hope we can stay in touch. And I look forward to the day that you and I, like I said, can stand together shoulder to shoulder. And I raise my glass to you. I raise my glass. And, cheers. and just send a big hug to my sister, Bia, who lives in New York and was the one who connected us. Yeah. So Absolutely. thank you, Bia, for this beautiful conversation that you made it possible. 
Yes, thanks. Uh, cheers to Bia and uh, cheers to you, Marcel. I really appreciate it. We'll put all the links and everything in the show notes so anybody who wants to find out any more about AOS Stowe can absolutely do so. And I mean, I wish you the best, man. And if you need anything, I would, I'm, I'm here. My shoulder is here. My ears are here for you, man. Thank you very much. Your words are my words. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> cheers, cheers, brother. Cheers. Bye.